You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. We return this week with a fabulous short by the English author Thomas Burke, The Man Who Lost His Head. The story first appeared in the November 1935 edition of the Blue Book magazine. Something had happened which didn't happen. Something out of nature. Something against the sun. We hope you enjoy it. The Man Who Lost His Head by Thomas Burke The accident that befell Peter Smoth was no such accident as is met by compensation from our popular daily papers. Their Catholic and imaginative lists stop short of that kind of accident. It is said of many of us when, in times demanding the packed thought of an hour, we are unable to attain even a moment's reflection, that we have lost our heads. The term is one of those passionately tropical images which fall so glibly from the lips of accountants, stockbrokers, cricket umpires, and other repressed poets. But with Peter Smooth, the thing happened. He did actually lose his head and live to know that he had lost it. It began in that restiveness which comes to many a man at fifty. He came to see his life as flat and unprofitable. He looked about him, and saw, or thought he saw, other men leading vivid-coloured lives, lives as full of zest and effulgence as a fire-opal, while his own had been safe, warm, and dull. He was fifty, and he had had none of that highly charged life of which he read in the newspapers. He forgot, of course, that they were they and he was he, and that a man cannot choose his way of life. He can be only what his chemistry and his karma allow him to be. He can be only himself. To seek to be something else is to throw the whole mechanism of his being out of gear. But Peter Smooth was sick of being himself, and at fifty he decided to be something else, anything else. He felt it a sorry thing that a man's life should run on one set of rails that a man should spend his little span in being but one kind of man, a soldier, an actor, a geologist, a scholar, a lawyer, a painter. Why couldn't he have a little of each? He realized that at fifty it was too late to try for a little of each, but at least he would have something different. He'd had enough of his rails, and since most of his life was gone, this was the time, if ever, while he was yet able and healthy, to try something new, something utterly alien to his previous experience. So, upon a fine morning, he packed a small bag and left his Kensington flat without any word of his intention, and was never again seen in it. He had no clear plan other than escape into a new world. A passing delivery van gave him his first pointer. He saw the words, Pentonville Road, and he hailed a taxi and said, Pentonville Road. He stopped the taxi halfway up the long ascent of that road, and went down a side turning. There he took the first turning on the right. He walked down this littered street, studying its decrepit houses. One of them, not so decrepit as the rest, had a card in its window. Lodgings for a respectable single man. He knocked at its door, and when it was opened, he crossed the threshold of that house, and of his former life. In that street he remained for four months. He was within a threepenny bus ride of his own home, yet after a week or two, as far from it as if he were in Iceland, he became one more of the annual hundreds of mysterious disappearances, and he became a new man. He ate in squalid little eating houses, he hung about the Islington streets and talked to all sorts and conditions. He consorted in bars with the um, less favoured specimens. He learned to use their talk and do their things, and 
soon to accept their thought. He told himself that he was having a high old time. He looked back on his staid bourgeois life with impatience and contempt, to think of the years he had wasted on it. He wondered how he'd endured it so long. He wondered why he had looked with shivers on the kind of life he was now leading. He gave his old self a grimy laugh. He felt that he was now leading the real bohemian life, not the well-to-do imitation of it, and realized that it was the life he had always secretly wanted to lead. His friends, he thought, would call it going to pieces. He himself called it branching out. He thought of the anecdotage with which he could surprise them when the mood took him to return. He thought of the wisdom by which he could shock the innocence of two of them, who claimed to know things because they dabbled in social service. He did not know that he was not going back. There came a night when he met, in an obscure tavern near King's Cross, a man from whom he would have shrunk a few months ago, but whom now he saw as an interesting man. The creature was dark-haired and untidy. His face and hands were so unclean that they gave dreadful hints about the rest of his body. He wore a tattered overcoat with the collar turned up. The collar was buttoned, and the rest of the coat hung from him in a fork. He used the unclean hands to stress the key word of every sentence in a way that suggested the Near East. He too was about fifty, but he had led a more tumbled life than Peter Smooth, and his face was lined and drawn. But the eyes were brighter and more alert than Peter Smooth's. They had been called to look upon strange and unexpected things in their fifty years, while Peter Smooth, until four months ago, had seen little that was strange and unexpected. He still had, in moments of repose, the calm eye of the clubman. The stranger, having selected Peter Smooth for his audience, began to talk of things he had seen. He revealed not only alert eyes, but a brain. It was not the kind of brain Peter Smooth knew in Kensington and his clubs, but he would have been disappointed if it were. The man talked of really strange things, and talked of them as casually as men talk of a visit to the theatre. He talked of the power. He talked of the Petit Albert as others talk of the latest novel. He talked of the sword and the cup, and of things he had seen done in Greece. Mind you, I don't talk in this way to these people here. It would be a waste. But you, sir— I perceived at once are an educated man. You think, these people, he waved the soiled hand and the funereal fingernails, these people, cattle, dross for cemeteries, impossible to talk to. But you, I see, think things out. You're not bemused by such childish nonsense as laws and such artificially created things as crime. Dope, don't you agree? All dope. When I see the way that tenth-rate little lumbugs in power bemuse the mass of the people with their stale old tricks, I could— He finished on a crescendo of profanity. Peter Smooth hugged himself. Most interesting man, he thought. Lovely type. Quite like one of these master criminals. Aloud, he said, Won't you have a drink with me? Don't mind. Make it a whiskey and peppermint. When the drinks came, he said— Suppose we sit down. Could you pull that other chair over to this table? Smooth went over and fetched the chair. The soiled hand shot into the pocket of the soiled overcoat. The soiled hands carried the glasses to the table. The hand that held the glass of Peter Smooth went back to the overcoat pocket. Now we can talk. My views perhaps may seem extreme to you. But often to reach the desirable middle, it is necessary to exert ourselves towards the extreme. There was a man I knew in Greece, an extraordinary man. You'd have liked him. Satan, we called him. I learned a lot from him. Oh, a lot. Not all I wanted to learn, or I wouldn't be in this place talking to you. But enough to be useful from time to time. His views I used to consider extreme but I found it was only aiming further than he wished to reach, which is what I always do. I remember once in Marseille, 
when I was in some little trouble. Peter Smoth repeated to himself that this was lovely. He was in touch with the real underworld of which he had read in novels. This man, talking a farrago of street profanity and sham education, good phrases and illiterate phrases, was a find. He decided that he must cultivate him. After a return of drinks, they parted on Peter Smith's suggestion that they meet the next evening. The stranger thought it likely that they would. He could not be sure. Affairs might detain him, but he hoped to be there. If not, some other night. As they went out, Smith trod on a tiny empty capsule which lay by the stranger's feet. He did not notice that he had trod on anything. He walked to his dingy room in a queer state of elation and fatigue. The man's appearance and talk had elated him, but something else about the man had exhausted him. It was as though he had sucked all vitality from the air about them, and left smooth only the nitrogen. His head was light, and his legs were heavy. It was a clear, dry night, and still early— just the night for one of those prowls in dim quarters, which had become a habit with him. But he found that he wanted only to be in bed. The ten-minute climb from King's Cross to that bed called for an effort. It seemed unattainably distant. Every hundred yards seemed a mile. But after some hours of plodding he made it, and was surprised to see that his clock showed that he had left King's Cross twelve minutes ago. His first awareness of himself next morning was that he was a living thirst. He could not realize arms or legs or life itself. His whole being was thirst, and his only sense perception came through the throat. He got up to seek water, and drained three glasses. Within a few minutes, his mind and body resumed the normal coursing of life, and he felt able to wash and dress. Having washed and half-dressed, he prepared to shave, and it was here that the normal coursing of life was again arrested, and his being became one extreme sickness. He had just taken up the shaving stick, and had tilted the mirror, when he dropped the shaving stick, and almost knocked the little mirror to the floor. The face that looked back at him from the mirror wasn't his. He had tilted the mirror in the casual faith that it would show him what it had shown him throughout every day of all his years, a chubby pink face, a little blonde moustache, blue eyes, and thin blonde hair. What it did show him was black, lank hair, a lined and drawn face, dark, restless eyes, a black forecast of beard, and a general air of grubbiness. Wondering whether it were nightmare, or if he was still suffering from last night, he rubbed his hand heavily across his face and looked again. There was no doubt of it. He was awake. From the street came the cries of the morning. From below came the familiar sounds of that dingy house. From the window he saw the bedraggled figures he saw every morning, and in the mirror he saw a face that was not his. Before he understood the full implication of what had happened— and the frightful dilemma in which it placed him, he was aware only of that sickness which comes to all men in presence of the unaccountable. Something had happened which didn't happen, something out of nature, something against the sun. We live by a peaceable faith in the course of nature, a faith which takes so much for granted that if the morning sun were to shine upon us from the west and the stars appear in daylight— we should stand still in dismay. For the moment, Peter Smoth stood still in dismay. Four times he went to the mirror, and four times he sat down and stared at the carpet. The impossible thing had happened. He had a new face. The rest of his body was the body he had known for fifty years. His hands and legs, which he examined slowly and in fear, were his. The face— was not. At the fourth examination of it, he felt that, strange and repellent as it was, he had seen it before. He spent some minutes in trying to remember where he had seen it, 
and only after searching about all the queer faces he had seen in the last few months did he recall last night. The interesting man in the bar— and then he recalled the unusual effect of two glasses of light beer. The face he saw in the mirror was the face of the interesting man. When, in the course of an hour, he came to consider his position in relation to everyday affairs, he realized that he could not face the woman of the house. He would be a stranger. He would be a stranger everywhere. One thought came to him— the thought that comes to every man in every kind of disaster. Flight. At eleven o'clock, when, as he knew by custom, the woman was out, he fled. He took his bag and fled, and boarded the first bus that came along. He sat in the bus with the desolate feeling of being nobody. His light pretense in leaving home and sinking his identity under an assumed name was now changed to dismal fact. He was not Peter Smooth, and he was not really the interesting man in the bar. He had achieved completely what he had thought he wanted. He had got away from himself. He left the bus at the Strand, and took the bus behind it, which was labelled for Waterloo. He did not know why he should go to Waterloo, but he decided that he might as well go there as anywhere else. It was distant from Islington and from Kensington, and it was a quarter which, outside the platforms of its station, was known to nobody of his own sort. In a dim street off Lower Marsh, he found a room to let, and into it he took his misery. He hunched himself on the narrow bed and tried to realize what had happened, and to follow out its implications, but the thing would not resolve itself into thought. He could only look at it and wonder— a wild hope came to him that as this mad thing had happened, so it might unhappen. It might last only for a while. Whatever madness was at work upon him might exhaust itself, and he would find himself again Peter Smooth. He thought of his Kensington flat, and prayed that the thing might pass, and that he might be again Peter Smooth, and abandon his foolish antics of the last few months. Every fifteen minutes— he went to the mirror, but the mirror had nothing for him. Towards late afternoon, his feeling of sickness increased, and he realized that he had eaten nothing. With an effort, he dragged himself out to seek some secluded eating house. But he went no farther in his search than some twenty paces. He had scarcely left the house when two men confronted him. They confronted him very solidly, one on either side of him. The stouter of the two said, "'Just a moment. We're police officers. What's your name?' "'Uh, what? Uh, Peter? Uh, Arthur Exford?' The man studied him. "'You answer to the description of a man wanted by the Southampton Police, known as Boris Goodlatch.' Uh, "'That's not my name. I've never in my life been in Southampton.' "'I see.' The officer looked at the poor street and the shabby creature, and seemed trying to reconcile the street and the shabbiness with the delicate voice. He made his decision on the street and the shabbiness, and took Peter Smooth by the arm. "'You better come along to the station. If there's a mistake, we can soon settle it.' He turned to his companion, and nodded towards the house. His companion went to the house, and Peter Smooth was taken to the station. At first he was bewildered and incoherent, as all respectable men are when their arms are taken by policemen. He could not clearly grasp what was happening, or why, or what he should do. He could only utter feeble protests. At the station he was told that he must expect to wait a while, as officers were coming from Southampton with witnesses. If a mistake had been made— he would no doubt understand that the interests of justice must be served even at inconvenience to innocent people. He continued to protest. I don't know what it's all about. I've never been in Southampton in my life, and my name isn't the name you mentioned. I'll admit that it isn't the name I gave. Under this new trouble, he forgot the trouble that had come upon him in the morning. There was no mirror in the station, and he talked to them as himself— 
No, it isn't the name I gave. I had a private reason for giving that. Nothing to do with anything that would interest you. I've just been going about London, seeing life. Actually, my name is Peter Smooth. My address is Helsingfors Mansions, Kensington. You'll find me in the telephone book, and you can ring up and ask my man to come along. You were there yesterday? Uh, no. No, I wasn't there yesterday. I haven't been there for a month or so. I told you I've been wandering about London. But I left my man enough to go on with, and he'll probably be there. Well, we'll ring him up. They rang up and they told Peter Smooth that his man was coming along by taxi, and had expressed some anxiety concerning the disappearance of his employer. The officer, not certain whether he had an amiable eccentric or a bluffing criminal, gave the benefit to courtesy, and assured him that if he were the man he claimed to be, everything would be all right, save for the inconvenience which couldn't be avoided. Within half an hour his man arrived, and he got up from his hard chair with a gasp of relief. Hendrick! Hendrick took no notice. He turned to the officer. Where's Mr. Smooth? The officer said, There. Hendrick looked round the room. No, that's not him. Peter Smooth became indignant. What's the matter with you, Hendrick? I am here. Hendrick looked again at him. Don't know what you're talking about. You're not my Mr. Smooth. But I am. Hendrick, uh, my parrot, Mulvaney. You know the parrot, Mulvaney. And my collection of enamels. And the cabinet in the corner with the bohemian glass. Hendrick. The officer looked at both of them. Hendrick looked at the officer and indicated Peter Smooth with a nod. Seems to know a lot about Mr. Smooth's habits and his flat. But that ain't Mr. Smooth. I've been with Mr. Smooth eleven years. I ought to know him. He went off sudden-like some months ago, and I haven't seen him since. But that ain't him. My Mr. Smooth was yellow-haired and pink, chubby face sort of, and blue eyes, always very neat and what you might call spruce. That's no more him than I am. But Hendrick. Hendrick was thanked for coming, and Peter Smooth was left alone. He was left alone for half an hour, which gave him time to realize his folly in sending for Hendrick. The impossibility of explaining to Hendrick that though he had lost his head, he was still Peter Smooth. The impossibility of explaining to police officers that a man could lose his head and go about with a head that didn't belong to him. The impossibility of explaining anything. And then his loneliness was broken. Four other men came into the room. They were ushered in by an officer, and they sat down on chairs, gingerly and self-consciously. An odd lot. A man who looked like a clerk. A man who smelt of fish. A man who looked wicked enough to double-cross Satan. And a man who couldn't look anything, because his eyes were everywhere, and his face was constantly changing. The only point they had in common— was shabby appearance. They had had only the time to look round the room and grin or grimace at each other, when a big man came in and presented a young girl to the company. She stood in the doorway and looked them over one by one. The big man said, Well, without hesitation, she pointed to Peter Smooth. That one. Sure. Absolutely. Wearing different clothes, but the face is unmistakable. I saw it quite clearly when he stood in the light before he started running. Thank you. He called through the door. Take Miss Jones to the next room. Don't let her see the young man. Then send the young man. A young man came in. He too studied the company. The officer lifted his head in inquiry. The young man nodded. Yes, over there by the window. That one. He pointed to Peter Smooth. Sure. He says he's never been in Southampton at any time. I'm certain that's the man I saw. Different clothes, but the face, I saw it quite clearly for some seconds. Don't see faces like that every day. Not in Southampton, anyway. The young man was waved out. And when he was gone, the four other men in the room were waved out. The officer turned to Smooth. 
Two witnesses have identified you as a man wanted by the Southampton police. I held a warrant for the arrest of that man, known, among other names, as Boris Goodlatch, on a charge of murder. Murder? It is my duty to detain you, and take you to Southampton to answer a charge of robbery at a jeweller's shop in Hamstram Street at five o'clock yesterday afternoon, and of murdering John Smith. It is my duty— But I tell you again, I've never in my life been in Southampton. It's ridiculous. It's rubbish. These people are making a mistake. I— You're at liberty to make a statement or not, as you please. If you wish to make a statement, it is my duty to warn you that anything you may say may be used in— I have not been out of London at all the last four months. I was in London all day yesterday. I was wandering about all the afternoon, and I can call witnesses who saw me at nine o'clock near King's Cross, and— The officer had held up his hand, but it wasn't the warning hand that made him break off. It was the realization that he had spoken to nobody through the whole afternoon, and had stopped nowhere, and the realization that a man could have been in Southampton at five o'clock, and yet have reached a King's Cross bar by nine o'clock. If you don't wish to make a statement, the officer said, it would be better to say nothing for the present. So Peter Smoth said nothing. He saw the utter futility of making a statement. He saw the impossibility of an alibi, and the idiocy of telling this man, or any man, that somebody took his head away last night and gave him his present head in exchange. He closed his mouth and dropped his hands, and suffered himself to be taken to Southampton, and confronted with three more eyewitnesses. Six weeks later he learnt his lesson. He learnt in exaggerated form what every man learns in some degree who commits his kind of folly. He learnt that when a man willfully flies from his life, when he willfully loses his true self or his head, he has lost it forever. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.